and welcome to our Tableau Analytic User Group. So, uh, just some word about this uh, user group is a little special. So, um, it's very a user group dedicated to learning about analytic around Tableau. That is on Tableau Desktop, Web Edit as data. We have also a Tableau coming around uh, often, like to show uh, the new features. And it's a virtual user group happening every month. And we try to be global, so we have like dedicated time for dedicated time zone. But we will see that later. And um, yes, it's really around analytics. So here it's like two QR codes for you to get in touch. The first one, you have like all of past events. So if you go on the first one, you can already register for uh, the one for April, for user group for April. But you also have like uh, the recording of all our past session with the direct link to YouTube. And on the second one is our Tableau Public Forum that you can also subscribe. And each time we had like a, an event, I copy paste all the, use, uh, the speaker material on Tableau Public Forum on this uh, space. So you can also uh, uh, follow and grab all the information that has been presented. Uh, so obviously I'm not alone <laughs> to lead this uh, Tableau Analytic User Group. Um, Today, Sedal will join. So Sedal uh, Michael, who is a digital insight analyst at Purple Strategy, is living in the US. We have Samantha Bachelor that will join in April with me. Uh, she is data visualization lead in Australia and myself uh, living in Europe. Uh, so some word about Sedal. Sedal is a desktop specialist, a Tableau feature author, and uh, active member of the Community Equity Task Force, uh, is passionate about data and uh, also about wine. Samantha um, is, uh, like I said, data visualization lead at Brisbane. She loves develop dashboard, data viz strategy, and uh, visiting about Nintendo. And um, my and myself, I click too quickly. <laughs> like I said, I'm leading uh, the Tableau Center of Enablement for Swiss Bank. I love Tableau, chocolate, and my dog, maybe not on this order. And I'm located in Zurich, and I have uh, the chance uh, to have been uh, named a Tableau Visionary this year, and I'm also Tableau Ambassador. Uh, if you want, you can join our Data Plus Women <laughs> Zurich event. <laughs> Uh, here I put the QR code or uh, follow me on uh, social media. That is my beautiful dog. Okay, let's uh, get started. Um, so our planning, uh, like I said, is today it's US and Europe friendly. Next time it will be APAC and Europe friendly. And in May it will be again APAC and US. So we try different time zones to see uh, what is more convenient for everyone. So the ground rule for today, it's just enjoy. If you have a question to our speaker, use the Q&A. But if you just want to uh, talk, comment, and say how good the session are, you can use the chat. Uh, you can also um, tweet uh, using the hashtag analytic tug. It will be a pleasure uh, to answer. And the session is being recorded, so just enjoy. Today I have a problem with the click. Yes, so let me introduce our amazing speaker. The first uh, speaker that we have today will be Will Strauss. He will present something about funny business. I cannot wait, Will. Will is a Tableau uh, ambassador. He's leading the Boston Tug and is a consultant for PH Data. Um, yeah. He likes to uh, help clients to engage with their data. And when he's not visiting, Will owns and operates a small family farm in southern New Hampshire. And he likes orchids. So with that, I will just stop uh, sharing my screen. Um, and after Will's presentation, we will introduce the second speaker that we have today. Will, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. And I don't like orchids. I love them. Um, 
almost as much as I love Tableau. So let's get started. Let me pull this up. I'm going to share my screen, which is this big, beautiful blue one up here. I'm hoping you guys can see that. Oh, okay. And let's start the show. Okay. So the name of my talk today is Funny Business. And like Annabelle said, uh, my name is Will Strauss. Uh, I work as a principal consultant with PH Data. I am a Tableau ambassador for the Boston Tug. And the reason I'm squinting so hard in that picture is because I live in New Hampshire and I needed a headshot in the winter. So I went outside in the freezing wind and snow blindness. And it's ironically smoldering because I was so cold standing out there. My poor wife having to take that picture. So I get to move your faces because you guys are writing my notes. So you, you might have thought to yourself, funny business, a funny how? Well, this guy has had a lot of fun over the last decade using Tableau. And I wanna share some of that with you and talk about some advanced analytics techniques that might expand what you do at work. I enjoy visualizing uh, data about agriculture in general, especially my own farm data. Uh, to track our livestock, our gardens, and the native producers that we have. And we're going to do a little bit of that. Games are fun. Sports are games. Sports of Sunday is awesome. And I got some of that coming too. And video games. I have fun with formats, stretching out the limits of vertical and horizontal scrolling. I'm not doing any of that, but I did like making them spin. I had a great deal of fun making this circular calendar viz showing how the vast majority of religious holidays just so happen to group around the solar holidays. And I sent this out as my virtual holiday card this year. So not that kind of fun today, no data mischief, but I thought that was fun. This is the fun I wanna talk about today, the fun behind these beautiful charts. This is what we're all striving for in our biz business. And of course, these are super samples from my awesome colleagues at PH Data. Band spars and line charts, oh my, right? But we really start here. We start with our very first look at the data. And in my experience, data analytics and visualization is a little bit more about flow. So business on the final views in the front and a wicked sweet flow behind it. The most important insights that end up on that published BizViz are the product of combing through the data with multiple analytics methods and then styling it back up in the best way to tell a complete story. We all know that, that's why we're here. On a slightly more serious note, that does take some trust, a willingness to see things without fully understanding them first. I'm sharing this work from a Danish physicist, Tornori Trainers, because it's not overstating to say that seeing this data visualization changed my life and my career. What he's doing here is he's comparing the bandwidth of information flowing through our sensory networks and data capacity. The amount of inf visual information coming through our eyes to our brains is akin to an entire computer network. Our sense of touch limits the range of a USB port, uh, hearing and smelling like a disk drive we taste separate from scent. Uh, from scent like a four function calculator. And all the while, we're really only aware of about 0.7% of that information. The trick, and by trick, you know, the entire aim of analytics and data visualization is to maximize the amount of information that flows from sight to our active awareness. Today, I'm very, very honored to be telling my data jokes and to all my data friends, data fam, and my professional family at PH Data. I joined PH Data just this last December and I have enjoyed every single minute of it. It is extremely hum humbling to work with such a group of uh, a talented people. And I'm, I'm gonna be talking about this crazy crew throughout my talk, so let's, uh, let's get weird. For those of you who may have never noticed, a tree map is not a tree nor a map, just like this image. Tree map is a wonderful chart to communicate part to whole with multiple dimensional cuts, leveraging size and color and fitting everything into one view. 
Dream maps can also display magnitude. Like in this example, uh, I added population and then dra uh, I took uh, the years onto the pages window. So you could see the global growing population in relationship to this uh, Freedom House data source showing the relative freedom of press in each country as the population booms from 5.6 billion to 7.2 billion. I will admit, some people say they don't like tree maps. Doesn't mean they're bad people. I mean, not entirely, they might be bad people, I don't know. And sure, bar charts make it different, like they make differences in magnitude much easier to detect. And labels tend to always fit into bar charts where tree maps really have room for all the labels. Personally, I love that tree maps are one view. They quickly highlight outliers and are perfect for those urgent part to whole problems. The first example I'm gonna be sharing is from our data coach learning platform, uh, the Tableau Fundamentals course. It's an amazing way for anybody new to get started, learn from some of the best Tableau experts in the world, create practice views and dashboards from real world examples and actual one-on-one -on -one coaching. So instead of using superstore data, which a lot of people will do on these professional examples, I chose to use some farm data. So I downloaded a seedling catalog uh, from our state nursery to create my spring tree seedling order. And I created these visualizations uh, to help keep me in my budget, see the area requirements that I needed for all these different trees and maintain diversity. And of course, it's, it's about trees. I had to make a tree map. So let me pull up that example. Okay. And I'll throw this into presentation mode. Of course, the Zoom is covering that control, so we'll skip that part. Um, so my data was very simple. I had individual species of saplings that I could get. I did an estimated adult area that the plant would need or the tree would need to grow, the age of the species, if that was there, and then the cost of package. Now I couldn't buy these one at a time. I had to buy them in groups of 10 or 12. So I just wanna show you, these are all of the uh, views and techniques that I'm showing in this example are in our fundamentals course. There's, there's no parameters, there's no crazy set actions, there's, there's no intermediate or even second level skills. This is all stuff that you should you can build using Tableau right out of the box. Come on, sweetie. Okay. So first thing I did is just very simple scatter plot, something we're all familiar with, showing the individual uh, the individual trees. I divided the quantity of the packages by their cost and was able to come up with like a, a general uh, unit cost. So I can map out each tree to say, okay, this is, uh, maybe this is a $2,500 $2, package of trees, but it's actually only 50 cents a sapling. And there was a clear correlation between higher quantity and lower unit price. I didn't have any trending data, so I had to create some. So there were species that were offered at two years old and three years old at different prices or three years old and four years old. So these slope charts on the bottom showed the difference in price of the same species at a two-year-old versus a three-year-old tree. And this is essentially showing me what the gain on my investment. Every year, most of these trees technically will increase somewhere between 20 and 30% uh, in their value. So if I wanted to resell them and keep them potted, I could make a profit off of buying these trees. In my individual section over here, I added this nice little hierarchy table so I can drag in by the catalog group, specific genus. I'm gonna talk a lot about genus and species and stuff throughout this. So anybody who doesn't have a background of taxonomy, I'm sorry, but genus just means group. Um, so I could get down to the individual package level and see, okay, I can keep in my brain that white pine and red pine are a pretty good deal. Now, I only have about six and a half acres of maybe only two of that I can actually plant on. So I wanted to see an area, part of whole, if I bought everything in the catalog, how much space would that need? This tree map is sized by the area requirements. So the first thing I did is I made a calculation to say, okay, can you take out like this giant black walnut 
that takes almost five acres just to plant a quantity of a thousand because I don't have that space. So let's get rid of everything that even the individual packages can't fit. On the top right, these charts, I added in a little hash mark to say, okay, I only had about two acres to plant and I only want to spend at most a thousand dollars. So what I can do now is go in here and check out these individual trees. And okay, maybe I want babies. I only want like two and one year old trees. Okay, getting a little under budget. I know I'm not gonna buy a quantity of anything of like a thousand or five. Let's just keep it to the 25s. Now I'm already under my cost and I could buy everything here, but I have a huge area limit. Could I have communicated the same thing with the bar chart? Maybe, but I wouldn't be able to see it all at the same time. I wouldn't be able to see all the species. I can go really quickly in here and say, okay, let me just get rid of this black walnut and this red oak and maybe some of the pussy willow. They're very pretty though. And I keep playing with this and I'm not gonna drill all the way down to it because we have lots of examples, but all I have to do is make sure I can keep drilling down until I get the bar under here. And then I just export this final sheet, show up, here's my order list. And that was how I executed a tree map here. Now, because I know Annabelle is also an orchid fan, I wanted to make sure I had at least one orchid example. So let me go over this Orcadia data sample. This is from a recent, relatively recent study where they were trying to catalog the species of orchids. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, orchids are probably the largest group of flowering plants. There are estimated to be around 30,000 individual species and thousands of groups within those species of those species. So if I wanted to make what I was interested in is how many of these orchids have been discovered over time. So if I drag date on top here, and I hate that this thing is right in the way. Okay, we'll move this to the exact date. And then I'm gonna take a count distinct of species, which I had already created. Okay, I could see some stuff here. There was a big peak in orchid discovery in the early 20th century. And then another huge peak around 2000, coincidentally, right when the study was taking place. And if anybody is wondering when down here, these peaks, this is when Darwin got really, really obsessed with orchids and first defined that abominable mystery of the evolution of flowers being way faster than, he almost discarded the whole theory of evolution just because of flowers and specifically orchids. They just changed too fast and too specifically. Okay, this is cool, but if I wanted to look at this by genus or groups of species, so we're gonna grab genus and bring it over to what, color? There's 1100 different genus in this group. Well, that doesn't help me. Ah, uh, maybe I'll make it an area chart. That is a little bit better. There's still a lot of loose ends. Bulbophyllums, there's a lot of fun species in there. Dendrobiums, I love. I have a dendrobium the billy that's just beautiful. But I don't know. This is this is just not a great view for me. We'll make a new view. And if I take that genus into detail and the species I count, oops, not that one, this one, shoot. Go over here to the show me tab, boom. Oh, wow. Now I can see that there were a ton of bulbophyllums discovered, a ton of dendrobiums discovered, but I'm still not really sure when that happened. Okay, so let's bring in year. Again, we'll bring this into detail in a year. Okay, this is not super helpful. I can see some, some outliers, of really large groups that were created. And maybe that's what I'm interested in. So I can quickly visually go in and out of these outliers. If I wanted to show this same chart over time, 
this is a classic problem of tree maps that bothers people to no end. There are marks here. There might be one or two, but they're so small you can't even see them. And even if I aggregate the data up from year to decade, and this is always a calculation that I use for translating year to decade, if anybody hasn't used this one before, it's just year of your date minus the year of your date in the modulus function times 10, uh, modulus 10, okay? So if we replace year and date, okay, it's a little bit better, but I really still can't see these marks. What you can do is create a parameter and a new calculated field. So I created this parameter. Let me open it up so you can see what it is. And all it says is absolute value or percent by decade. Where's my parameter? So what I did is when you select the user selects the parameter saying absolute value, just show me that count distinct of species. When it's percent by decade, there's a table calculation that looks at the percent of total within that decade. So what that allows me to do, we'll replace this and this on color. And let's shrink this a little bit so we can maybe see everything all together. Okay, so this is the absolute value. And let's edit this calculation so that it works correctly. Compute using Excel. And as I edit those, now I can look at each one of these decades and I can see, okay, in that early section where there were only maybe four species individually selected, I can then look and say, okay, what was the biggest impact at that time? This is a great little trick to make a tree map of useful business visualization. This is exactly something that I've used in accounting where you're looking at like write-offs or uh, account receivable. And there are these huge giant accounts or, or things that get written off and they take up the whole screen and you can't see all the other marks. By using this tool, it allows you to drill down at the row level. Whoop. Let me go back to this. Bam. So there's, there's some Oregon data for you, Annabelle. Um, now, okay, we're on this now. Next slide, next slide. Next slide, next slide. Okay, here we are. So maybe you want that the within the tree map to have an ordered grouping instead of kind of going in the corner and, and vertically and horizontally towards the from top left to bottom right. Mary Meckel chart is a great way to keep everything awesome about tree maps and still communicate uh, part to whole and offer that control. I'm not going to demo this chart type right now because we have another cool example to go to. Uh, but here's a great video from our fearless leader and Tableau visionary Luke Stanky as part of our huge data coach how to library. Ternary charts. Ternary charts are great. Where scatter plots offer insight along two measures, ternary plots try. I will I will promise you that I'm going to. Uh, say chart and plot, call it whatever you want. I apologize in advance if anybody's really that hard on semantics. I'm gonna demonstrate very quickly how to build a simple ternary plot using three fixed variables with only about a half a dozen calculated fields and then show you a way using parameters to go far beyond that. Uh, on the left there, I use, I've use i used these in the past uh, for Tableau Public and professional settings. That's a Tableau Public offering where I took um, soil samples from around my farm and then did a part to whole analysis of sand, silt, and clay, and then mapped them out on a ternary plot. Uh, to the right of those are two of the most famous examples from Tableau Public uh, from Ken Fleurledge charting superhero abilities and Adam McCain uh, analyzing dialogue from the Game of Thrones series, which I love. My dogs are named Khaleesi and Hodor, just so you know. Um, 
Also a big shout out to uh, Ken and Kevin Fleurledge as well as Andy Creeble. They have great ternary how-tos that I've referenced in the past and, and to create the charts I'm gonna show you today. So let's get into it. Okay, I'm gonna pull this back up. And I'll show you, I'm gonna show you the prestige before we go in to build this, but this is what we're going to build, okay? And I told you we're gonna have a little sports fun. So the underlying data, if anybody is a NFL American football fan or a Madden video game fan. So if anybody knows video games, sports video games, players are given attributes, right? They have 98 speed and 75 strength and 38 awareness because they have their eyes closed the whole game. Like who knows, right? But in any sports game that you find, there's going to be a set of attributes applied to a player. Looking at two at a time, doesn't really give you a full sense. So what we're gonna to try to do is look at three. So let's open up a new example. And of course I have a toddler pushing down my door and let's get started here. So the first thing I wanted to do, and I'm not sure how I am on time. So for the sake of time, I don't think I'm gonna recreate all these calculations. Um, but I'll show you where I start. I just start really quickly with establishing my lowest level of detail. So if anybody has not concatenated fields in Tableau, they just need to be a string field. You use a plus sign in, in between. If you want to add extra characters or spaces or shapes, um, just put those within quotations. So I took a player's uh, jersey number, first name, last name, their position, and their overall abil ability, and I made this field. If I was making a scatter plot, and let's say I let's just go with awareness and tackling. And we'll take players down to detail. And we're going to change this to a scatter plot. There's something there. Um, I'm sure there's something very insightful in here. I can see some outliers, which makes sense because I have like kickers in here. So the kickers and punters should be all around the outside. They don't have a lot of these attributes, but I want to look at at least three at a time. So you guys, your faces are right in front of my couch. Okay, here we are. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at offensive linemen because nobody pays attention to linemen unless they get a holding penalty. And I happen to love offensive line. So we're going to create our bottom left, our bottom right, and our top calculations. The way a ternary plot works, again, is each section, the, the it can be a part of whole, uh, like zero to 100%. But the idea is that the most balanced players with all of these abilities will move towards the middle. And those that are have disproportionate skills will drift towards one corner or another based on what attribute we put in there. So the first thing we've created is what I want my bottom left to be for offensive linemen is pass blocking, okay? American football, quarterback goes back, he's gonna throw the ball down the field. There's these big, huge guys that have to make sure some other big, huge guys don't eat him alive. Now, all of these player ratings are already set from a scale of zero to 99. So we could do just uh, multiply that number, or excuse me, divide that number by 100 and come up with a zero to 99%. But you're not gonna have a lot of players that are really in the zero range. So you're gonna end up with a super calculated problem. So the reason that I use these window sums, this table calculation is to take the population and then set the limits. So this is what we're doing here. So um, we're taking the average pass blocking minus the window min of the average pass block, dividing it by the window max average. Again, we're just finding what are the what's the range, what's the outlier of our population. I'm going to repeat that step for the bottom right. Oop, not that one. which I chose to be run blocking. Okay, so quarterback's not throwing the ball. He's handing it off to a running back. And now those big guys have to push the other big guys back out of a hole, trapping, pulling, tossing, all this kind of great stuff. Uh, I could talk about offensive line play all day, but I won't, I promise. 
same exact calculation. We're just creating a group. And I don't think I need to show you the top, but again, at the top, well, I will show you the top because <coughs> in my head, I thought you have to, excuse me, we have COVID in the house. Anyway, um, the top metric is toughness. And I don't know, I don't know how the ratings adjusters come up with a toughness rating for another human being from watching film, but if you can quantify it, these guys do. So I was, all right, these are the three metrics that are, are definitely what we're looking for. So now we need to plot these. Plot these with X and Y axes. So for the X, and let me just pull this out so you guys can all see it. Okay, so we're using the zone function here just in case there's something that, that doesn't quite error or uh, that errors out or doesn't qualify, it gets filtered. Uh, we're doing 0.5 times two times that bottom left metric plus the top metric divided by the run block, pass block, and toughness all put together. That's going to get us um, the left to right movement. Because I had toughness at the top as the top metric, here we're again using that zone function. We're plotting in, in this triangle. So we're going to multiply square root times three divided by two times toughness at the top divided by, again, that the full, the combination of the three singular metrics uh, that we're putting in here. So as I go to plot these out, X on the top, Y on the bottom. Ooh, there's a triangle. That's fun. Well, I had the shape already in there, so this is cheating. But uh, what I am going to do is bring in our level of detail, which is those players, down to detail. I'm going to make sure that my table calculation is computing using the player. Ooh, you can see the marks coming down here already. Bam. And just with like six calculations, not even, we're able to get this whole population. So I, I put in all these blocking metrics. So you see some weird outliers. Again, these are probably positions that don't do a lot of blocking. Um, so let's go ahead and bring position. This is where knowing the sport comes in hand. Bring position on the filter. And I'm just going to pick offensive line and my centers, my guards, and my tackles. Monstrous men. Let me get rid of that background shape. Oh, you guys are always right in front of my. Here, we'll go back to the example. I'm going to leave it like this. And then because I already had the triangle loaded, it popped up. It's a live demo. Something has to look funky, right? I'm going to add in one more metric. We'll say this is the, the overall rating. So I snuck in a fourth metric here. We're going to take the overall rating and throw it on the size or color, excuse me. And we're going to take the overall again and throw it on a size this time. Change these marks to circles. We'll add a little transparency because we could see that they're overlapping. A little border to make them stick out against that background. Oh man, this is looking good already. I'm going to change this color with a nice diverging palette to tableau, black, blue to orange tableau. Ah, uh, is that white diverging? Yeah blue orange, and we'll make the orange uh, be the higher rankings. Ah, so now I can do some interesting visual analytics. And let me go over to the one that isn't so funky. And I'll tell you why I think this is interesting. There are occurrences that prove my thought that these are the three most important metrics to determine what makes a good lineman are not totally correct. So here's a player right in the middle, in blue, very small, Kelvin Beecham, who I think last played for the Jets, former Steeler, offensive lineman. His ratings are pretty low, but they're very balanced. And he's right in front of Teron Armistead, who just got like a $100 million contract to go play for the Dolphins in Miami, and his ratings are super high. So clearly just using these three, here's another example. Here's a tackle who has, again, relatively balanced skills, 
or a similar skills to this other player who's much, much better. So, so maybe this isn't it. It's three metrics, even four, but I, I just don't think I have enough. The good news is, is that we can go beyond that. If you noticed when we went through these first steps in my demo calcs, and actually let me bring up my, uh, my PowerPoint because I think I put together a nice little animation slide that shows you all this cool stuff that I'm about to show you. Okay, here we go. Okay. So you saw that we had hard coded in pass blocking, run blocking, toughness. Everybody remembers that, right? Oh, I can hear you all and I can see everybody nodding. Thank you so much for participating. By creating three parameters to replace, I should probably click, eh? I'm gonna create three parameters, one for the bottom left, one for the bottom right, and one for the top. I just created a table and copy and pasted from Excel the 60 different attributes that were available for these players in my data set. And I put it in a list. I then created three matching calculated fields to read that parameter selection and pick the attribute from my data. Then with, uh, again, we had this calculation where we were outlining the edges of our population skills and making it fit. Again, all I had to do was make sure I added in the uh, bottom left metric calc instead of pass blocking. And some slight edits to that X and Y calculation, again, using the new calculations that I built. And what I was able to build was this. So this is a data visualization I released today, specifically for this talk. And this allows the user to go through and select any combination of these metrics that they want. Now, thanks to some, let me pull up uh, the live example here. And you know what? I'm gonna pull this up on Tableau Public so that I can zoom in. Here we are. It's up here. And bam, 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 bam. Okay, here we are. So thanks to some very great feedback uh, from my team, this is an atypical chart type. And the way that I have the parameter sections, it's a little funky, right? Now, to help people understand the chart type, I love using interactive legends. So all I have to do is click here and then I have this nice little legend that pops right over my chart so they know exactly what we're looking at. Again, the balanced players go towards the middle, um, something I learned right from the footages. If you know anything about football, it's a very tactical game and there are huge playbooks of all these plays and these X's and O's, right? O's are the offensive players. And there's a line going around telling you where to go. So if you're not sure where to go here, you just ask the quarterback what the route is. So as I click on that, I know, okay, I'm gonna filter by position first. Come on, let me, all right, I gotta close that. You filter by position. All right, let's just look at, let's look at something different. Let's look at quarterbacks. Everybody loves quarterbacks. So open that up, okay. So pretty tough, but man, they cannot block. We can already see that from here. So if we go to quarterbacks and we'll change it to awareness. So I'm gonna put that one at the top actually. Throw power. Throw accuracy. I should have throw accuracy. Oh, bow, short, mid, deep. Okay, let's go with uh, awareness at the top. And this is professional sports. So I'm gonna throw total salary on the bottom. There. Now I have all of those metrics to choose from. Colt McCoy, you're very aware, man, but you are you just do not have an arm and you're working for free essentially. And I, I so say I was looking for someone, who do people like? I know everybody loves Tom Brady. Nobody has something bad to say about Tom Brady. Right? I'm a Steelers fan, by the way, just, just straight up Steelers fan, okay? So this, I'm just choosing Tom Brady because everybody knows it. Tom Brady. 
I'm going to highlight him. Look where he is. Man, he is very aware. He's certainly getting paid. He doesn't have the biggest arm. Don't quite need it. I added in two more parameters to replace where I just, I dragged overall onto uh, size and color before. Make those parameters too. So I'm going to have, I'm going to change the sizing to, I don't know. Years pro, barely adjusted, <laughs> all right? It's a kind of a tight scale. And we'll change the coloring to throw accuracy deep. Now I can see in the red are a little bit of my better deep ball throwers. This is a really fun example. Again, I started with locking in just three metrics and I didn't do the math. I'm sure there's a stats person on here who could tell me if I had five different options at 60, well, five different selectors with 60 different options and not repeating the same metric each time. How many different combinations that would be? Uh, but that's, that's your job, not mine. I turn numbers into pictures. That's what I do. You make the numbers. Okay. Let's pull this presentation back up. There we go. So just to follow up on this, I love ternary plots. They're not very intuitive. So do use legends, but do use them. Even if it's like you're just using them yourself, just like the tree plot uh, the, or tree map that I had shown before. Um, these are great visualizations just to get into it. See the data, see how it plays with itself. Trust your eyes to do all of the work of seeing groups and seeing movement and seeing stuff and then let your brain process it later. You don't have to put everything into a beautiful bar chart, line chart, ban right away. You don't have to start there. Just let the data tell you what it's saying. So you guys have a fun yet? Yeah? Well, that's too bad because it's over. Um, so <laughs> there are, there's plenty of fun to be had at PH Data. So don't forget to follow us. Uh, check out all the amazing content and success stories from our awesome partners on our website. And please feel free to reach out to me directly um, through the chat here today via social media, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, to, um, excuse me, oh, to, uh, to become one of our newest partners or one of our newest teammates. We're certainly still expanding. Um, I'm personally growing my team and I would love to add more awesome people from my data fam to my professional team. And again, thank you all so much for playing along. Um, I go have some fun out there. And that's it. That's my whole talk. I hope I didn't go too fast or too long. How's my time? Well, okay. Thank you. Your timing was very good, Will. Thank you very much. We had some questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, I will ask you some questions and we will pass to the second speaker, but feel free, free to answer as many questions that uh, stand up later. So um, one of the question is, what are the best practice to make the tree map more accessible, especially to the visual disabled impaired audience? Oh, that's a great question. Um, to, to visually impaired audience? Yes. Um, so one would definitely be, so that, that can go a couple ways. If you have, if you're near sighted, far sighted, or you just, the edges, you know, all of those fine marks are a little hazy. You can split them up. You can uh, use counter col colors to create the borders. Um, use another dimension to split them up, just like I did with Decade. That might make it a little easier to, to absorb. And uh, as always with accessibility, you know, being color conscious, um, you know, there's th that red to green stoplight palette. I use the blue to red. There is a, a, a smaller percentage of, of people, particularly men, that, that struggle with that, that red to, uh, to blue boundary. Uh, but there's plenty of colorblind, safe, um, continuous and divergent color palettes that you, can, that you can use that will help separate those boxes a bit. And uh, I would, you know, uh, Emily Cohn is someone I immediately think of when, when we ask questions about accessibility. Um, it's certainly not my, my area of expertise, uh, but it's something we're, we're highly conscious of. Now, 
if you're super visually impaired, it's, it is data visualization. There are, I know that, I mean, there is a, an outer limit to some of what you can do, uh, but I would defer to experts like, like Emily and, and others uh, to really dig into that question. Thank you, yeah, I think it, uh, it was good. Some people like me uh, love the sound effect that come with the Viz demo. <laughs> Sorry, I, I said to Animal before we started here, and this is a professional tip, um, talk to Tableau, you know, when it's, it's lazy loading or something, just be very sweet. I call Tableau sweetie, you know, and Han and Darlin probably like 10 times a day. And she's been very, very nice to me over my career. So I'm very nice back to her. Uh, yeah, and we will take like the last one and after please feel free to answer the other one. Ring your yeah, I'll, I'll jump into the Q&A right after Exactly. This. Are you limited to a triangle? Can the same technique be used on a pentagon, for example? Yes. Um, I am. Sh so there are radar charts where you'll have, you know, uh, polygon shapes where each corner is going out towards a spoke. Uh, and there are a lot of great features for that. I was trying to come up with a few of like a diamond or a pentagon for this in the and beyond section, but I realized where I was at time that I couldn't get it working last night. So yes, there are, but you're going to have to find someone a lot smarter than me to teach you. You are good enough, Will. Come on. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Will. Uh, let me introduce now uh, our second speaker, Steve. Yeah, we love your t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so let me share my screen. You know, guys, that I'm old and I'm always taking a lot of time. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, okay. Partage l'écran. So here is a quick Steve Wexler presentation because uh, I think that we don't need to present Steve. Steve is a very, very famous. Um, writer and evangelist in the community. He is a Tableau ex and master, so Tableau visionary, is on the Hall of Fame, he's Iron Beast winner, he's a founder of Tata Revelation. He wrote like fantastic book. Uh, he's the author of the big picture, how to use data visualization to make better decision. And also co-author of the big book of dashboard. I hope that you got a copy of this book because they are very, very good. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve also serves on the adversary board on the Data Visualization Society and is the host of the popular web series that I love, Chart Chat. And I always watch while ironing <laughs> because sometimes I'm still working when it's past, but very worth watching. And he will present today what to do and when you should do it. Steve, the stage is yours. Hey, thank you so much. You know, there's an adage in a show business, never follow an animal act or children. And uh, I'm going to add Will Strauss to that. Never follow Will Strauss. That was just an outstanding presentation, really deep, complicated content, but fun and engaging and really great. So um, charmed and delighted to get to share the presentation with him. And thanks for having me here today. Let me get this queued up, do the same thing, moving the little windows of people over here so they're out of the way. And hopefully you can see this without too much of a problem. So as Annabelle pointed out, I'm the founder, principal, sole employee of Data Revelations. I was Tableau's inaugural Iron Viz champion. That was a really long time ago. I am a Tableau Visionary Hall of Famer, whatever that is. I am one of the hosts of Chart Chat, and I am the co-author, along with Jeffrey Schaefer and Andy Cotgreave, of The Big Book of Dashboards. And much more recently, I'm the author of The Big Picture. And a lot of the stuff we're going to be seeing uh, can be found in The Big Picture. Anyone who has attended one of my presentations or workshops know I show some variation of this slide. You are encouraged to disagree with me. Good things happen when we debate and discuss data visualization, because I think we're all seeking to make it easier for people to understand data. So if there's something that doesn't resonate or you think there's a better way to show this or a better way to articulate it, when 
we have the little Q&A jam session. I'd love to hear from you about it. Um, kind of a catalyst for all of this came about, a Data Visualization Society. Uh, uh, Andy Krakow had an article called Dashboards Are Not Stories, and then did this kind of pop-up webinar where I chatted with him and several other fun people in the community because there's a lot of con confusion about, well, you know, what's data visualization? What's data storytelling? What's an infographic? Where and how do I need dashboards? We, we could have a whole discussion of just what the definition of a dashboard is. And then we could discuss whether we should use the Oxford comma or, or not. I realize some of these things are a little sexier to discuss than others. Also, just to manage your expectations, this is tool agnostic stuff. This is sort of big picture around how do I get people to understand what I want them to get? I'm not going to get into particulars about how to do that with Tableau. In any case, if you put a gun to my head, and I hope you won't do that, um, I'm going to borrow from this excellent book, Effective Data Storytelling from Brent Dykes, where he'll distinguish between data visualization and data storytelling. And you use data visualization to discover insights or find things in the data that maybe would have remained hidden, insights that you never would have seen without it being visualized, or insights that might have taken so much longer. You use data storytelling to communicate those insights. So let me try to come up with a couple of simple examples. Here's a data visualization. Seven-day rolling average COVID cases, King County. Ha, huh, you thought you thought you'd get away with a presentation without somebody mentioning COVID, and now we're, you know, both presenters have brought it up. So this might be data visualization. Well, here's some storytelling that we've added to it, and particularly the second point over here. You could say, oh, wait, that's just an annotation layer. Yes, but you're giving context, and you're bringing out, and you're letting somebody know, here's the thing that I really want you to look at. I um, I've had the pleasure of working on something called the Carbon Almanac, and you're going to be hearing a lot about that come June. It's a big project that's been spearheaded by Seth Godin. And here's some data about the top greenhouse gas emitters. And this is just the data visualization. Here's an attempt at some data storytelling. If cows were a country, they would be among the top greenhouse gas emitters. Now, that is um, Wexlerian simple data storytelling. Let me show you data storytelling in the hands of a real expert. Here's effective data storytelling. If cows were a country, they would be among the top greenhouse gas emitters. This comes from Gabrielle Merit and uh, doing something on behalf of McKinsey and company. And right now everybody was writing down, Steve thinks we should make cow charts. No, I'm not suggesting you should make cow charts, and but but she's doing something very effectively to kind of stop you in your tracks and take notice of this. And that also leads to, oh, what are infographics? Wouldn't this kind of more fit into the infographic category? And I realized, gee, if you were to ask me what an infographic is, could I even tell you? And, and this reminds me of a quote from Justice Potter Stewart. Uh, he's a, a Supreme Court justice, and he was asked to define pornography. And he said, I'm not going to give you a whole definition, but I know it when I see it. And that was kind of my take on infographics. I know it when I see it, but I'll share the definition that comes from Randy Crum, who is the author of a fine book called Cool Infographics. It's usually a larger graphic design that combines data visualization, illustrations, text, and images together into a format that tells a complete story. The entire story can be encapsulated in the infographic. It's not a curated presentation. It's just one thing. Um, they're also, this is me now elaborating, they're also for not for clearly defined audiences, so you often have to grab people's attention. So, here is something that Stephen Few, who's one of the great comment teachers and commentators on data visualization, he had issue with this a number of years ago. This is a big sprawling infographic that Time Magazine did at time.com. 
saying why we still need Women's Equality Day. And the notion was, gee, over half the people in the United States are women, but they're underrepresented, Supreme Court, the House of Representatives, et cetera. And Stephen Few was saying, why do you need this thing the, to explain this? It's all these different chart types too. You know, okay, hey, look at all the different chart types I can make. I can use isotypes to make a pictogram. Hey, I could do a stack bar chart. Look at me, I can make a pie chart. Look at me, I can make a waffle chart. Hey, look at me, I can make a, an armchair chart and et cetera. And is this an effective way to get people to see where there's maybe more equal or it's really far behind? So this is what Stephen Few suggested doing. I took a very similar path, representation and misrepresentation showing that voters over here, more than uh, half of the population of voters are women, but we can see where the, uh, that the Supreme Court has the largest representation and governors the lowest representation. Well, watch what happens if you put this in the hands of someone who's both very adept at data visualization is also a skilled graphic designer. And this comes from Alberto Cairo, and he did this in about 10 minutes. <laughs> Notice this chart in the middle, same chart I did, fashioned, but, and he'll be the first to say, hey, this was a quick sketch. It looks like the guy either has a gun or a boomerang, but the, he's doing something to kind of grab your attention and bring you into it. By the way, maybe the biggest thing that's going to grab your attention and bring you into it is the title. That cow chart. If it just had the cow and without the title, I don't know if it would work so effectively. So here's the sprawling thing on the left, and here is the very compact element on the right, and it allows for a much easier comparison of the elements, and I don't think you lose any of the attractiveness that comes in. All right, why do you even need dashboards? Ask the guy who co-authored a book about dashboards, and I'm gonna go back a little over five years ago, before the big book of dashboards came out. And I had the good fortune to attend, I'm just gonna go back to this, um, Cole Nussbaum or Netflix storytelling with data workshop. Um, she's written a brilliant book that I think a lot of you have probably read. And, and if you haven't, I highly recommend it. And I, I was kind of freaking out in going to this workshop, I'm thinking, why does anybody need the book we're gonna, that's about to come out in, in, in a couple of months? Why do people need dashboards? The stuff that I'm seeing Cole talk about is so great. And I'm gonna paraphrase her for a minute. She's talking about people when giving a presentation, showing all the background and everything they did said, you have to shuck a lot of oysters to find a single pearl on your presentations. Don't show all the shells you shucked, just show the pearl. And for sure, curating and finding the presentations, for sure, curating the findings and presenting them succinctly is key, but so are finding the pearls. And I realized, wait a second, this, this dashboard, this thing, could be an automated oyster shucker that you can use the dashboard to really find what's meaningful and important faster. Let me give you a, a case in point. I'm going to show you a Makeover Monday example. This comes from um, um, 100people.org, a world portrait. If the world were 100 people, how would you break them up? 50 would be female, 50 would be male, 25 would be children, et cetera. And this was the Makeover Monday exercise. Um, the, here is a graphic that was out in the wild. How would you make this over? So a lot of people took their stab at it. Um, here's an example from Carl Alchin. Here's an example from uh, Michael Mixon. And I decided to, take a look at this and how would I analyze the data, maybe not present the data. And I looked at our 
definition by our, I mean, Andy Cockreave, Jeff Schaefer, and myself, our definition of a dashboard. A dashboard is a visual display of data used to monitor conditions and or facilitate understanding. Maybe I'm just going to use the dashboard to help me understand what I've got in the data, and then I can decide how I'm going to run with it. So here's that same data presented as a really boring bar chart, but it's easy for me to make the comparison within all the different segments that are here. And maybe I decide to focus on nutrition and notice that one out of 100 people are starving. And what does that actually mean, one out of 100? Now, I don't have the chops to do what I'm about to show you, but Athen Macronis does have this. So starting with this understanding, said, what can I do to probably try to really hit people? And I think this is a, a remarkably effective graphic, but it started with an understanding of the data and then stating, gee, how might I show this so it grabs people's attention? I think he did a, a, a wonderful job here. The other reason for a dashboard is I agree, curate your findings. Don't just say, hey, here, here's this wonderful exploratory dashboard that I created. Go find something useful in the data. But what happens? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus first on interactivity. That that sometimes one chart just isn't enough to get at the crux of stuff. So I'm gonna show you uh, an example of a dashboard that's used in a very successful hedge fund. So this is a, a live working dashboard, but the sectors and the funds are, have been anonymized. So what we can see here is we've got all these different sectors and within them are all these funds and the blue funds going up are profitable and here are the unprofitable ones. So you can see, hey, you know, this sector all, all the way on the right, that looks pretty profitable. And this one on the left looks unprofitable. Well, maybe I wanna see overall how profitable or unprofitable are each of the sectors. Oh, I need another chart for this. Well, that's just the sectors. Maybe I wanna look at each individual fund. Okay, I will create a tornado chart to see which ones are profitable and which ones are unprofitable. Maybe we'll put some bands, some big ass numbers at the top that tells you, oh, blue, profitable, orange, unprofitable. And in fact, our net is really very good. But now we wanna have some interactivity. The one that most interests me is sector K because it's, wow, I see a bunch of things that are profitable and unprofitable, highlight that. And now I can see all the funds that make it up and I can see, yeah, it's got some really profitable funds here, but it's got the two, you know, the, the two worst. What's up with that? All right. The other reason I like to have that dashboard handy is let's say I've curated a presentation and someone asked me a question that's not covered in the presentation. So, hey, I've done my due diligence. I have a pretty good idea what's important to my audience. And I know they're really interested in superstore data. <laughs> said no one ever, um, but they're really interested in this subcategory. Copiers and faxes have gone from second worst to fourth best. Okay, that's a great you know lead title for the slide and here's the chart to back it up and we can see that. Suppose someone says, yeah, but I'm interested in something else. I've seen so many organizations create decks with 500 slides that have like every cut of the data. Oh my gosh, what a horrible use of somebody's time to create a deck like that when, hey, I only care about three of the slides. So, gee, I can answer that question on demand with the dashboard that drives this. Here, I'll show you this particular item. So, I want to underscore that a good dashboard can help you find the good stories and answer ad hoc questions. And now I'm going to say something that may be a little controversial. I think it's okay to have a boring dashboard. That, that bar chart showing the if the world were 100 people, but the presentation about the findings should be absolutely riveting. All right, I have a confession. Um, I'm reasonably adept at Tableau, but some of the stuff I see people making with it, I'm thinking, are these people even using the same tool? that I'm using, I, I look at the stuff they're making. Here's something that came from Johnny Walker, 
a few years ago. Here's something from Michael Cisneros. Here's something from Ludovic Tavernier. This is not Tableau. This comes from Georgia Lupi. Incredible piece of work. This is maybe Jeff Schaefer's favorite dashboard uh, about uh, Nobel laureates. And um, do they all need PhDs? And do they all work at prestigious universities? Or is it possible you know, to just have a BA and get a Nobel laureate and other facets about it as well? But I want to caution you about some of the social media pro, um, uh, programs that are out there for helping you hone your skills. And I'm really sorry to see that Makeover Monday has stopped after a three or four year run. It was absolutely incredible. Um, I love that we now have real world fake data from Tableau's own Mark Bradborn. But let's look at an example that was, um, was out in the wild in a Makeover Monday uh, challenge that was put together. Here is something that was published a few years ago, and it's showing over a two and a half year period that Snapchat went from really not being used much by teens to being the most popular uh, by teens. And I bet you Instagram has changed since then. I'm sure TikTok would now be in here, et cetera. Is this the best way to show the change over time? Ready, set, go. Let's see what people come up with, right? Here is something from uh, Mafuj Khan using a waffle chart, not something that's native to Tableau, but is eminently doable. Here is something that came from one of my favorite practitioners, Corey Jones, and he is borrowing a technique developed by Roddy Zakovich. Roddy is brilliant, uh, does brilliant work, and he said, hey, I, I want to show not just that it went from fourth place to first place, but I wanna show you know, just what the percentage of people are. He calls this an area bump chart. Any of you familiar with Power BI will know, oh, well, that's just a ribbon chart. And I gotta tell you, every time I see something that looks like this, it, it just looks like the Beatles and Yellow Submarine to me. But let's now look at, wait a second, why are people getting all fancy and stuff? Why the waffle chart? Why the area bump chart? How about something like this? and showing, oh, I can clearly see that um, the yellow thing was down here and now it's up here. And here's the one that wins the day for me. Everything's gray. I'm gonna focus on the thing that the, the person who has curated it wants me to notice. And here's what I think is so cool. Look who developed this one, Roddy Zakovich, the same guy who made the badass um, area bump chart said, well, that's not a really effective way to show this. <laughs> I'm just going to do uh, a, a slope graph because I think that's a clear way to make sure my audience understand what's going on. So this is kind of why I have mad respect for him. All right. And then we show you now a fun example and where I kind of worried that, that, that um, Twitter kind of went off the rails with something. This is one really weird chart. The idea behind it is what the most profitable companies make per second. And when this was done a few years ago, Apple made $1,444.76 every second of the day. And the time it's taken me to tell you this, they've made $20,000. i am sorry, $22,000. i am sorry, $24,000. You get the idea. Well, how would you visualize this? Love this one from uh, Zach Geis. What a simple, clear, wonderful chart. Good to what do the most profitable companies make per each second? Great title. And look at the call out there, the data storytelling element there. Fantastic. Here's a similar visualization with no commentary whatsoever, you know, not calling out anything, but it comes from Curtis Harris. He did a great job making a mobile version of this. And he worked for a long time or maybe does still at Pluralsight and they're just, everybody there writes code. So everybody has dark background dashboards. This one comes from Philip Riggs, does brilliant work. He wanted to focus on pharmaceutical companies and, 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 and look at which pharmaceutical company was the highest. So he did a great job kind of drawing your attention here to this. 
you know, he's a cartoonist. He has a superpower that I don't and few people do. He's highlighting the one that he wants you to notice and he's giving commentary about it. So the visualization is analytically spot on, rock solid, super easy to make the comparisons. And he's done some storytelling around it. All right, here was the one that people went crazy about. What the most profitable companies make per second. And this comes from Mark Bradburn. He's given me permission to do this. And it's, everyone went, wow, that looks so cool. How did you do that? Oh, wow. This is, uh, um, I, I want to see how to do that. And I remember looking at it and going, well, is that the right title? Should it be what the most profitable companies make per second? Or is that what the, the title should be? North Korean ballistic missile tests. Sorry about the timing of this one. But around the same time that I was seeing this, there was an article in the New York Times about what teenagers are learning from online porn. And when you see something like this and everybody getting really excited about it and going, oh, wow, that's so cool. How did you do it? Getting the most likes, moving the guest retweets. It's, oh, I, I guess I should be making stuff like that. By the way, it doesn't help that until a few years ago, this is what on, was on Tableau's homepage. Yeah, that looks cool, but that's really not a very useful chart. Sorry, Tableau, you know I love you. In any case, you see all these things and you're wondering, well, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> you know, when, when, you know, should I be making stuff that looks like that? And, and look, I suffer from this as well. I'm very intimidated by a lot of the stuff that's out there. So let me kind of walk you through my design pressures. And I think some of them are, you know, a lot of you will have a similar uh, vibe about it. If it's just for me, the design can be really simple. For a work group, all right, it needs to be a little nicer, departmental. If this is something for a senior executive, it's got to have a certain polish and panache to it as well. And the hardest thing I work on is something that's customer facing. It's customer facing, it is a reflection of the company. It's the brand. So if this is being embedded inside a product we're making, it has to look great. That something for the general public, which is usually what you see what an infographic is about. You think some really amazing visualization in Wired Magazine. Yeah. I have the feeling, well, this has to be amazing. Otherwise, people are, are you know, what am I going to do to stop them from turning the page? I don't live in this area. Now, if you are asking me to help you with an infographic, it means the other 15 people you asked must be busy. So this notion that you have to attract people and inform, engage, and persuade, yes, if you're living in the general purpose, what am I going to do to stop people in their tracks? Maybe that's true. But I, I think within a business context, probably not. So I don't think you need to do the attract part. You absolutely have to inform, engage, and persuade. But by all means, make your visualization attractive. All right, I'm going to show you a couple, you know, two or three examples of some data storytelling using some simple stuff. But any of you who have uh, attended a presentation or workshop that I've done know that I really hone in on this. I think your job is to one, know who is your audience? What are you trying to tell them? And you are here to provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. So I do wanna show some data visualization and data storytelling examples. These all come from the big picture. Here is, let me, um, uh, do the setup on this. This is for a pharmaceutical company uh, um, called Universa. It's made up. Their product, Mercolax, is an antidepressant, also a made up. This is a real world scenario. This is something that Cole Nussbaumer and Affleck allowed me to include in the big picture. And the there was a marked preference for Mercolax versus the competitors, but this is the slide they came up with. And people did not understand what was going on here. The, in fact, they thought people preferred, oh yeah, I can see, yeah, the competitor is the teal color. I guess people like, here's, here's the killer slide, by the way. Talk about burying the lead. It's, so Cole met with 
the group and said, well, we need to understand our audience. And it became apparent there was more than one audience. There were two audiences. So one was people who would be attending like a, a luncheon, psychiatrists who would be attending a luncheon and someone would be presenting something. That's one audience they're sitting through a lunch. The second is um, salespeople making calls on physicians and they had at most 90 seconds to make their case. So here are the two different slides they came up with, but this first slide, this, uh, you know, the, the, the waffle chart, it was not presented just like this. There was a slow reveal. That's part of the storytelling that's done. So this is what they prepared. Consider a square and imagine a single square represents a patient in our study. There were 99 patients in our study. Okay, now I'm kind of understanding how the waffle works. 10 people didn't have a preference. 70 people preferred Mercolax, 19 people preferred the competitor. Oh, at this point, I think we're kind of done. Of the people who preferred us, Mercolax, 34 cited a lack of mood swings, 29 cited better anxiety relief, and then the rest said no you know, other reasons. And this is how they put the whole slide together. The other slide was pretty much just, hey, 71% like us, only 19% like them, and here's why. And the impact was, well, it worked. They didn't get oddball questions. Many more prescriptions were starting to be written. It was much easier to convey the effectiveness of it and, and how much better performing amongst survey respondents this was. Now, that Waffle chart is kind of an oddball chart. So I want you to, if you have not met him, this is Andy Cockreave, one of my fellow authors on the Big Book of Dashboards, and I want you to become acquainted with Cockreave's Law. The longer an innovative visualization exists, the probability someone says it should have been a line or bar chart approaches one, which is, I'm sure, what people said about uh, the amazing ternary chart that we saw from Mr. Strauss a little while ago. So I asked Cole, why didn't you just do this? Or if you wanted to make it a unit chart showing these are people, why not do something like this? Look here, I have the little isotypes here. And she said, we looked at it, we considered it, but we knew our audience and they would like the riddle or the presentation of the waffle chart. So, okay, I'm, I'm gonna have to defer. At, at this point and go, if you knew your audience and how they would respond, then do something which is better. By the way, the waffle chart can be really effective. I thought this is amazing work uh, from R Lindsay Poulter, who's one of my favorite practitioners and um, uh, showing the percentage of CEOs who are black people in the Fortune 500. So I wouldn't say use it that often, but it can be very effective. All right, I'm gonna to go to another kind of weird oddball chart. This comes from Greg Lewandowski, who is a beloved member of the data fam, the Tableau community. And he was working with a huge organization who had 25,000 partners selling their product. I can't imagine that. And he was asked to say, hey, show us the top 10, show us the top 25. And we say, well, why do you want the top 25? Why do you want the top 50? No one had a good answer. It was like, um, Gee, and I don't know, shouldn't you be looking at the top 50? So he, he was looking at the stratification of this and he was astounded to discover something. Nine of the 25,000 partners made up 25% of the sales. And that 192 made up um, just less than 1% made up 75% of the sales. You know, I, I was sure this was going to be an 80-20 type of Pareto thing when he was telling me about it. So he decided to present it this way. Imagine each dot is a partner. There are 25,000 dots. 25% of our income comes from this many partners. 75% of our income comes from this many partners. And, and, and it was gobsmacking to people who saw this and said, well, who are these people and how did they get there? And, and, and did they start out always being great or did they move to be really powerful? And maybe we can find others that have the potential to be like this. 
And I can't believe I'm showing this because if you were to ask me how many times out of 100 should I use a bar or a line chart for something eye catching, I'd say 99 times out of 100 use the bar or line, but maybe you have a good reason for doing this. In any case, the impact was kind of this shock and awe. It was called the jawbreaker data visualization because it was the sound of people's jaws dropping when they, uh, when they saw the results and their jaws hitting the table. I'm gonna share just one more example with you and it's very simple data visualization and a little bit of storytelling. And I, I chart this out because it had a pr profound effect on my career, just seeing the reaction to this. Let me give you the setup. I'm working with a major healthcare company. They have data on thousands of companies and millions of people. Their goal was to save costs, but also save lives through compliance. How can we get by? They, they, they would look at their... The, the, the millions of people were employees and their families. And they were trying to figure out, well, what are the companies that have you know, um, more cases than one would expect of heart disease, how can we get them to do something about this? And in this case, I'm gonna show you, they are focusing on diabetes. And here's this one organization that has um, the, the percentage of people Employees and their families who have diabetes is 18.5%, but the average of all organizations like their organization is 4.9%. And, and it would show them a slide by, like this. And it just didn't, it didn't get in anything but concerned looks. It didn't move the needle, pardon the, um, uh, the pun there on, on that. How can we get them to kind of see where they are and just what an unenviable outlier they are? So we created a sequence. So similar type of thing. You're, you know, each dot represents a different organization. There are 790 different dots. Dots near the bottom, low incidence of diabetes. Dots near the top, high incidence. By the way, it's hard to see there are 790 dots here. So we jittered them. Say, hey, let's just spread them out so that you can see way more dots down here at the bottom than up at the top. Here is a demarcation point. Anything above this line, you are in the worst 1%. And here's where your organization is. And I've never, that was the first time I really saw people react to a data visualization and get it. We made it about them. By the way, I'm not doing anything really fancy here. I'm just using position from a common baseline. And this thing is so much further ahead than the others. And, uh, I'm, um, and I'm just showing grouping. And there's, there's very few things up at the top. A little bit of data storytelling to kind of parse this out, but pretty simple stuff. So as you're trying to create things that will get people to understand, appreciate, and maybe change their behavior, let me give you some useful guidelines. And I'm going to borrow from the far side, you know, pants first, then shoes. Get the aha first, then you can do the ooh ah. If it doesn't have analytic integrity, if it's not clear, if it's just fancy stuff, I think you've lost that. Also, always be really thinking about who is your audience. And maybe I could have done a better job. Annabelle, I discussed this with Annabelle and she said, no, I think this will be good for our audience here. But the, the, I came across this quote recently in reading uh, Say It With Charts by George uh, Zalanzi from um, McKinsey and Company. It's, it's a book from like 30 or 40 years ago. I love this. This is Ken Hamer's uh, presentation manager at AT&T. Designing a presentation without an audience in mind is like writing a love letter and addressing it to whom it may concern. So in any case, who's your audience? What's the message? And you are here to provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. And always when you're thinking about making that fancy stuff, remember Roddy Zakovich who could make fancy stuff, but didn't in that case. Ask yourself, are you helping your audience or are you showing off how smart you are? Now, you know, maybe you can do both. In any case, if you're trying to understand this whole um, 
visualization versus dashboards versus storytelling and infographic. Well, I would say every, all these things have the visualization in play. And then you may include visualizations in your dashboards and you may use the dashboards to find great stories and what you do in the stories, well, I don't know if you're going to create an infographic or not. But if you're, um, by the way, and the infographic, I don't live in that world. And it's really hard because your audience is not clearly defined. And I just said, it's really important to know your audience. In any case, if you're looking for guidance on these things, and you know what will help me with it, there, there are probably 100 books on data visualization. Uh, better data visualizations, Jonathan Schwabish, data visualization from Andy Kirk. Uh, my recent uh, contribution here is the big picture. Th this is much more geared towards the consumer of charts and dashboards and getting them to be fluent in the language of graphics. Dashboard design, certainly the big book of dashboards. I got a lot out of Stephen Few's book. Storytelling, here are three that I think are stellar. Storytelling with data from Cole Nussbaum and Affleck. Randy, uh, excuse me, Brent Dyke's book, Effective Data Storytelling, Gar Reynolds, Presentation Zen. And I don't live in the infographic world that much, but I really do like Randy. He's a great um, champion of lots of people within the space. And he's written a, a wonderful book called, called Cool Infographics. I'd be delighted to continue the discussion with you about this. We can answer some questions here, but if you have better examples or you think I'm wrong, send me an email to swexler at datarevelations.com. You can follow me at Twitter at datarevelations.com. You can also download some free samples from both of these books at datarevelations.com. Hey, so thanks so much for um, allowing me to chat with you today. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Yes. Um... Hi, Steve. Um, thank you, Annabelle, for all of your uh, coverage over the past hour, wrapping up a few things. Um, but Steve, great presentation. I think your perspective continues to be really insightful to everybody, you know, people that are newer, but also people um, who've been doing this for a while. Um, one question that I found interesting would be curious your perspective on organizations, trying to get organizations from cross tabs, Excel tables, et cetera, into more acceptance for the value that visualizations can bring, especially when it comes to simplifying information. But now, did, did, did I set this person up to ask that question? Did I pay them ahead of time and say, please ask this question? Um, this Can is I confirm absolutely... or deny? Yeah, okay. <laughs> The um this this has become my my passion right now is to recognize th there's so many organizations that are clinging to spreadsheets and you can you know and 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 are making decisions just looking at tables full of numbers and are missing how transformative it can be if they can get good at data visualization and are comfortable with the language of charts and graphs. It's a wonderful made up word called graphicacy. Look at, look, Ben Jones left Tableau a number of years ago and founded dataliteracy.com. Look at all the things Tableau is doing. It wants to um, train 10 million people over the next five years to be conversant in this language of charts and graphs. This is the whole reason why I wrote the big picture. Yes, I would love practitioners to read it, but it was mostly to help your, the organization recognize how frigging valuable everybody that's in this um, gathering today, how important they are to the organization and how they should be embracing and helping you with what you're doing, because it can really transform the organization. So we need to be out there showing them how much better and faster they can make decisions but make it easy for them, you know? So that may mean, oh, wow, this ternary, I don't, I'm, um, the ternary plot is great, but maybe they're not ready for that just yet. And show them something simple and show, oh my gosh, that thing, uh, I'm, my apologies for the long-windedness of this, but obviously you're striking a, a chord with me. 
but I'll show an example of the spreadsheet and then I'll ask people, I'll ask them say, find the biggest number, find the smallest number, the most profitable, the least profitable. It takes 25 seconds and only 80% of people get it right. He's just frozen for me. It is useful. So that that's kind of my response to that. Sorry, Steve. We got we got just before. I assume you're a story. We lost a little bit of the story. I assume the idea is that you know that if you're looking at a not higher number in an Excel sheet versus looking at it on like say a line graph or a bar graph, something like okay, that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I said crap out. Try to go really fast with this. It's hey, here's here's this little cross tab. Find the most profitable thing, the least profitable thing. Show it to people. It takes 25 seconds. Only 80% of them get it right. 20% get it wrong. They say that, that. Then you make one change to this thing. You just color code all the cells, make it a highlight table. So you, you're still giving people the spreadsheet. There's still numbers there, but you're using it. data visualization. Instead of it taking 25 seconds, it takes three seconds. Everybody gets it right. And this huge epiphany of, oh, Maybe there's something to this data visualization. This thing took one eighth as long and everybody got it right versus 20% of people making a mistake. Sure. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely right. I think that, you know, to me, the other, I would say the important thing that you said inside of what you said is like, take people a bit more on a journey. I think it's easier for us as data folks to say, obviously this, this looks perfect in a scatter plot, create a scatter plot that has dual axes and, Is it is a Dow's uh, moment to, uh, um, and am I the curse of uh, poor internet connectivity? Maybe, maybe. So that got frozen. So yeah, wow. But that's if we got to get a screen. That looks cool. It's cool like uh, this. I, when yeah, I got frozen, is, I'm not, is, I'm not is, so cool. <laughs> hold on, I'm getting the screen capture here. All right, we're good. Okay, so let me, uh, so thank you very much, Steve. If you have time, you can uh, answer some of the question. Uh, maybe Sedal will come back, but <laughs> we have to proceed and um, introduce our last but not least speaker of the day. So again, let me uh, share my screen one more time. Okay, so that was not, sorry. So oh, let me introduce, ah, Sedal, you are back. So you can introduce Abby. <laughs> you are back, but you are saying no to me. <laughs> so maybe- No, thank you. I uh, am having myself a day clearly, but always, as always great to have you as a teammate uh, and making sure that we can keep this moving. But yes, uh, very excited to introduce Abby. Um, most, I, I would imagine most people know Abby or met her before, seen her speak, um, but for those who haven't, uh, Tableau Zen Master, she started, I believe, the, the Lagos uh, Tableau user group and is now a data product owner at Paystack. Um, she discovered Tableau in 2017, uh, and, and I think like a lot of people realize that lots of people are so focused on building things and software development. And, and I would say that I think my experience, at least in this in DC, has been similar, but not as much on analytics, not as much as much on data visualization, and saw a real need to fill that gap, uh, which I, I think we're all thankful for because I think she's starting to do that for other people by um, some of the she is running, traveling, exploring new restaurants and doing crazy things like jumping off a plane. That's probably the only thing I wouldn't do with Abby. Um, but otherwise, uh, she's also a co-founder of Beyond a Curved Spine, which is an NGO raising awareness for scoliosis uh, in Nigeria, which is, is awesome. Where do you find the time, Abby? Um, otherwise, I will let you speak on how to gauge your numbers. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Abisola, short form Abi. I'm based out of Lagos, Nigeria. Um, <laughs> I'm distracted by the chat. Hi, John. Um, yes, Fela is a big um, music expert from Nigeria. Um, anyways, I'll just go ahead. Um, today, I'll be speaking on gauge your numbers. I need to give a caveat first. Um, because our former, our previous conversations from Steve, especially that just ended this, was focused on talking about using um, reasonable charts, right? And a gauge chart is not really the number one chart you would pick, right? When you want to do visuals, um, but it could be interesting in um, in some in some ways, right? So um, I'm just going to share how to build a charts it's going to be a walkthrough um, a pre recorded of some of the videos um just so we don't have any internet issues but yeah um so i'll just get right into it like sedal said i'm a three times tableau visionary for the money known as zen master i'm a data product owner at paystack which is a fintech uh based out of lagos nigeria and was recently acquired by stripe i've been in data for about five years I lead We Visualize. Um, it's a data community, data visualization community in Lagos, Nigeria as well. And I like to think of myself as a field protector of cold spines because I also run an NGO called Beyond the Cold Spine. So yeah. And of course, that's me jumping off a plane. I try to do interesting things when I'm not at my computer. And I also play tennis. I'm no Serena Williams though, but um, I think I can handle a good racket. <laughs> All right, so let's get into um, what a gate chart is. So gate charts are typically used to display like maximum, minimum, and present value of data that is being analyzed. And if you're familiar with the dashboard of your, of your car, right, you can see like that speedometer gauge, right? So that's like where these gate charts actually originates from. Right. Um, and for example, in an executive dashboard, maybe you have a target of twenty thousand dollars, right? Um, you know that you're targeting your target is twenty thousand dollars. So you can use a, your gauge chart to measure how close are you right to that target. Um, if you're in a financial institution, if your success rate that you're targeting is maybe a hundred percent, you can use a gauge chart to indicate and visualize, okay, how close are you? right to that hundred percent right it's just a, a different way to um visualize um targets right um so of course i'm just going to get into it yes and of course you can think of a gate chart as half of a donut right um the donut looks very young but sorry i don't have donuts to give out today <laughs> okay so let's start so to build a good chart right you need to start from building a donut chart right um so i'm just going to walk you through what the process is like. Um, all right, so let's do that. So first of all, if you're familiar with the Superstore data set, right, on, on Tableau, right, you just pull in the orders sheet into the data source tab, right? And when you do that to create a donut chart, you double click on the rules shelf um, and type zero to create a Dummy calculated field. Um, just another heads up. There are going to be some hacks, right? Because this is not a typical Tableau chart, so there are lots of hacks to arrive at this donut and this gate chart, right? So you type a zero to create a dummy calculated field, right? And then on the second field that you've created, first of all, you need to convert it to a pi, and then um, on the second field that you've created, you make it a dual axis, right? And then on the inner um, section of the donut, right, you want to change the color to a background color so it matches, right? And then you change the size, right? So when you do that, yeah, depending on how big or wide you have your donut charts, right? So that's the first step. And then of course you can um, make the entire view wide so you see the entire thing. So that's the first thing you need to do. You need to build your donut chart, right? So. Now we've built our donut charts and um, sorry, let me move to my next slide. Right, so in the gate chart, for example, in the first one I showed you, you saw that there were different color codes, right? So for us to get those color calculations, right? We need to create 
a calculated field. Um, I will be creating quite a number of calculated fields as we go on. So next step is to create the calculated fields. Um, again, like I said, there are quite a number of hacks. Um, so the first thing is you want to create, we're creating this calculated field because we want to distribute the donor charts, right, based on a particular value. And the value we've picked for this demo is um, percentage profit, right? So profit percentage. Um, so we're going to create a calculated field, first of all, to calculate that profit percentage based on the superstore sample data set that we have. Um, we're going to use an LOD, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, but this is the calculation. It shows you, um, calculates the percentage to total of profits for each category, right? And then next, we're going to create a few other calculated fields, right? Um, so first of all is, again, another hack you need to. Um, if you remember, right, the gauge chart is half of a donor chart, right? So we need to cover the bottom half. The bottom half needs to disappear. So how are we going to do that? We're going to create a bottom half calculation and call it a minimum of one, right? Um, and when we do that, um, this gate chart would require the upper half of the donuts, right, to display the range from zero to 100, right? So fine, now we have created the bottom half calculation. So let's go to the other calculated fields, right, which is um, the colored, we're going to just give you random names. Let's call it to find, so let's say the profit percentage is less than 50%. How are we going to show that? Right, we're going to use this calculation that says that if, so we're going to use an if statement here, that if the percentage, right, is less than 0 0.5, which is 50%, then give us that same percentage, else return 50%, right? And this is a bunch of many other, we're going to repeat this similar calculation um, a few times, but we're just going to walk through it. And of course you don't need to, this session is recorded, so you can always go back and I'll also share like a YouTube reference. Um, this is just to show you that you can actually do something like this in Tableau um, in case you were curious or you're experimenting um, because that's how, I mean, you improve anyways. You need to do different experiments. Um, so of course, um, th this is the second um, calculation for when we're looking for the value that is greater than 50%, right? We're going to create another, um, another calculation for that to measure that band, right? And we are going to do this. So this says that if the percentage is greater than 50%, then subtract 50% from that, right? Um, so we have that. And then we're going to do two more versions of that. Um, this is for another color coding, right? So this says that if it's less than 50% again, um, profit percentage, um, less than 50%, then you're going to subtract 0 0.5, which is 50% from that percentage, right? And then it's the simple calculation. So apologies if it looks gibberish, I promise you it's not um, as scary as it looks, right? And then this is the final um, calculation that we're going to be using, which is the other half of the gray, which says if it's greater than 50%, um, if it's greater than 50%, you're going to subtract again from the percentage from one, right? And then end, right? Um, so that's pretty much it for the calculations. Um, we have two more calculations to go, but I'll explain to you what the calculations are about. So um, of course you can use this filter on the bot next left, right? To um, group all your calculations together just so you're not confused. That's like a different way to have a neat um, panel. Um, so yeah, I just put this as another explanation, right? So if you remember that at the earlier stage, we wanted to hide the bottom half of our donut, right? And to do that, right, um, this angle is 22 degrees, right? And the maximum value is one because 100% is one. So that's why in the calculations, right, we had to use like minus one, one minus the percentage, right? So I just wanted to add that additional context. Great. 
So now the next thing is in your speedometer, right? You know that it's that pointer or a needle, right? That's telling you exactly where you are as you're approaching your target amount. So how do we create this? Um, how do we create these needle calculations, right? So that's also pretty um, straightforward. Ah, Christine, <laughs> I'm glad you found this helpful. Um, okay, so let's create the needles. Right, so we're going to create the first needle and the second needle, right? Um, again, like I said, this is a hacky way to achieve something that is not typically done in Tableau. So you have to look out for the hacks. Um, so here it says if your percentage profit is less than or equal to 0 0.5, then 0 0.005, you end it. And you're doing the same thing as well for the second needle point, right? Same, um, similar calculation. If the profit percentage is um, greater than 0 0.5, then 0 0.005 and then you end it, right? So now we have our calculations for uh, less than 50% and are greater than 50% and we have our calculation for our needles, also known as our pointers, right? So yeah, I just put, these are all the calculations that we've created so far. Um, if you filter on the left, you can, you're able to see calculations that you've created. That's like, yeah, just another feature in Tableau. Um, okay, so now we've done that. So let's build our gauge charts. Um, right. So this is the fun part, I promise you. So it's just going to look like I'm dragging things all over the place. Um, yeah. So now we need to we want to create the gauges, right? So let's start building the charts. We'll pull your major names into your filters, right? You remove all the calculations that you didn't create. Um, so you can manually uncheck all of that, right? And then, um, yeah, so needle one, needle two, these are the ones you've created. So, and that's all you need because that's what we're working with, right? And then when you do that, you now have to pull your major names into the color section, right? And then you pull your measure values into the angle section. So you see that something is beginning to form, right? We're not yet there, we're almost there, right? Um, and then we need to arrange the slices of the pie. Do you get that's how we're going to show the order, right? So you're going to arrange it in a particular way, colored greater than 50%, um, the second needle, um, gray greater than 50%, the bottom half, because we need our bottom of our donuts to disappear, of course. Um, the colored less than 50%, your, your first point, the needle, um, and then gray less than 50%. When you do that, you also now need to do some changes because again, it's a hack. You have to color like your measures on the all mark section, right? Because there are two different circles actually, but you need to pick the marks that says all, right? So here you need to pick a color for your needle right and you're going to make that black um, for both needles and then you're going to change the colors for everything every other thing too any color you want in this case we picked um pink right so you can change the color to whatever you want um and then remember the bottom half um calculation here remember that it needs to disappear so the color is going to be white um yeah Great, so uh, our donuts, our half donut is here. Um, and then we're just going to do another hacky thing. We're going to create a dummy field as well. And inside that dummy field, you're going to write dummy. Not because I'm a dummy, but just because that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, so you're going to add this field to the inner, inner pie, right? You add it to the, um, to the detail, right? Um, and then you're going to change that detail to color and then you're going to rename the colors as well or reselect the colors um, and at this point you see that it's created um, some temporary fields right to color the inner pie and then to create an arc for the gate charts right so now you color these temporary fields all your needles you make them black 
right? And the rest of the fields, they are white. They are white because that's the bottom of your donuts. Um, so we're just going to quickly walk through that. Um, yep, so you're going to color everything back to white because it's a half donut um, and you need all those colors to disappear. Um, if you attempt to do this for a work dashboard, just don't give edits option so that nobody can change the color and then your do not disappears. <laughs> um, so yeah, there we have it. We have our donuts. Um, I mean, you can view, you can um, view this by any dimension. So in Superstore, there's like the category um, dimension. So you can add that to the view in the columns and then um, you can make any changes that you want just to do like some form of formatting to make things look really nice and neat. Um, yeah, so that's it. So let's just quickly go over some formatting to make our work look nice because visuals need to be aesthetically pleasing. Um, so yeah, we've moved um, category to the column shelf and then we want to label it as well. So we, you move category to label, and then you move the same calculation, which is the profit percentage to label as well. You can see you have that there. You're definitely going to clean up like all the corners. You remove all the headers because those are not necessary and they're not needed. And then nobody's going to be reading this long percentages. So you need to change it, the filter to, so you change the formats to like a one decimal place. Um, hide the marks card. Um, and then right, so you can hide your max card, right? And then we've removed all these headers. And then just a bit more formatting things to make the work or to make your presentation look nice. Um, this is going to add color to the text. This is going to add color to the text, right? And just make it match um, what already exists, right? Um, so there you go. You can increase the font as well, um, just to, so that it's, it, it shows clearly that what you're trying to communicate um, to the viewer, right? Um, and yeah, there we have it. You can name your sheet, whatever, add it to a dashboard depending on what you want to do with it. Um, but I hope this has been helpful. Um, and of course, I'm going to give credit because I learned this, of course, on the pages of YouTube. But if you want to like check other resources, the Flailer trains, Ken Flailer has a detailed blog post on how to build a donut chart, sorry, a gate chart. And in fact, if you want to animate it, right, you can check out their their pages. Also for Phil Ferrin, um, they have like a more detailed blog post on how to build um, animated gauge charts. So thank you. Um, oh, I wanted to share my, well, if you're looking for me, I don't need to share it. I'm on Twitter at abbyviz, A-B-B-Y-E-I-Z. -E um, yeah, thank you for having me and thanks for listening awesome thank you abby I, don't, I think there's a lot of people really interested in the charts you can see there's there's applause happening in the chat as we speak um can you talk to you kind of mentioned i think maybe this is a good segue from steve's chat to abby's um you mentioned that maybe this isn't the first chart you should go to uh, what are maybe some common use cases for gauge charts that you found in your work? And you're, yeah. Yeah, because I work in finance, um, I work in a payments company, right? Um, it means that everyone that tries to make a payment via our gateway, that payment needs to be successful. So one of our metrics really is that 99.9% .9 success rate, right? So when you have a gauge chart, you can measure, okay, how close are we to our success rates? Do you get? 
and also for like the sales team as well if they have a target of twenty thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars or one million dollars using the gauge chart they can see how close they are or how far they are to that target so those are the two use cases um that we use internally yes um steve is right if you're trying to compare um more than one for example when we're doing success rates, we want to measure this week's performance to last week, right? Then you're going to have multiple gate charts, charts and that's not useful. So in that case, I actually do not recommend triggers. And again, I typically do not recommend it, but just that if you wanted to try something exciting or interesting, yeah, by all means. But if not, bar charts are always a good to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um... One of uh, one I thought was kind of interesting, um, and I know we've, we've got to wrap up. So uh, this last one: Is it possible to predefine colors in the gauge? So, like, say, set it at the first twenty-five percent is one color, the next fifty is one color. Yes, so, it is. Yes, and um, feel per per pairing. Like Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, feel pairing has a detailed blog post on that, and his version is even animated. So I'll recommend that you check out his nice. blog. You can just type his name, Phil Perrin, and put Gate Chat, and you'll see the link to his blog on that. Nice. Cool. Well, thank you so much, uh, Abby. There's a couple more questions if you want to tackle those in the, the Q&A uh, while we start to wrap up. But overall, um, really great job. And, and lots of people, I think, really enjoyed your talk. Thanks, everyone. It's good to be here. So really quickly, I'll start to wrap us up here. I uh, appreciate everybody uh, who came today. There's still, um, I think we, when I saw it, one of the highest points was around 900 and we're still around 500. So thank you everyone for, for hanging out with us. If you are interested in, in joining and would like to speak or you know someone that you would like to see speak, um, please let us know. You know, we've got some ideas, but it's always good to hear from others who you all want to hear um, speak at some of these sessions. The next session for those that are abroad is going to be uh, our APAC slash um, Europe one, and that's gonna be on April 28th. So in about four short weeks. Um, and so if you want to, you can obviously um, just go to our page, our user group, the analytics to user group, or uh, we'll send some promotionals out pretty soon. Uh, but I'll also leave this QR code up if anyone wants to take a picture and grab that now. Um, otherwise, another huge thanks to Will and Steve and Abby for, for speaking with us this week. Uh, and we will see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye.